Hey, welcome to Retail and MMT. Uh, I am doing, uh, if you don't know, I am doing um, readings from the book you see in front of you. Uh, I'm on chapter 16, and this book of macroeconomics is basically the modern monetary theory uh, macroeconomic book, textbook. Uh, anyway, so let's get into it. Uh, uh, chapter 16, Aggregate Supply. And 16.1 introduction. In chapter 15, our theory of expenditure and income determination linked aggregate spending to the generation of income. The focus on demand drivers of aggregate income and output abstracted from any spending impacts on the price level and assumed that most firms in the economy were rather passive. They simply responded to an increase in nominal spending by increasing real output up to the full capacity level in the economy. In doing so, we ignored the complexity of the supply chain and supply side. We also abstracted from what might happen after the economy reached its full capacity level. In this chapter, we seek to um, explore how the economy responds to an increase in nominal aggregate spending, the simple uh, reverse. I'm sorry. Uh, this, this, uh, in this chapter, we seek to explore the uh, uh, simple reserve L shaped supply curve we discussed in uh, chapter 12 of Mr. Sheen's and the classics is to simply do, simply to, simply to, represent real-world behavior. More generally, uh, each firm has three possible responses. One, to behave as quantity adjuster and increase output. Two, to, incre uh, to behave as a price adjuster and increase prices for its output. And three, a combination of both forms of adjustment. I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Uh, still in chapter 16. Um, in chapter 15, we assumed that firms were, uh, were for, we assumed that firms respond by increasing their output in uh, response one. When confronted with higher demand for their product products, quantity adjustment or quantity adjustment. However, in the real world, the other two possibilities might also be observed in this chapter, we consider the circumstances under which firms might deploy these different responses. To capture price setting behavior, we developed the widely used model of markup pricing, where firms have some market power and set prices to achieve a target profit margin over a unit cost. This model provides a rational or yeah, rational for the claim that over a normal range of capacity of uh, utilization and output, the price level is more or less constant. This means that as a as a first approximation, treating firms as quantity of adjusters in response to changing levels of total expenditure is a re reasonable assumption. However, we recognize that once full capacity is reached, firms can no longer increase production and therefore will respond to raising nominal expenditure or demand for their goods and services using price rationing strategy or response to. Further, we also recognize that different sectors in the economy will reach full capacity at different times and so some price increases might begin to be observed before the overall economy is at full capacity, or response three. This was Keynes' view on in chapter twenty, at the general uh, the, of the general theory, which uh, yeah, general theory which presented the unemployment function. Uh, he argued, I'm sorry, this employment function. He argued that the elasticity of employment and production 
Well, respect to uh, with respect to an increase of demand varies across industries. When demand rises, some combination of output and price increases will absorb the increased demand. With the proportions of varying across industries up to the point of economic wide uh, eco- economy wide full employment. Once that is reached, only prices can raise because firms cannot find more resources to produce more. The theory of aggregate supply thus seeks to explain the factors that impact on firms' decision to supply output in response to expected aggregate spending. It must therefore incorporate the three respond, uh, responses outlined above. The theory what we developed in this chapter will therefore complete the demand side model and, that we developed uh, in uh, chapter 15 to allow us to, pre- to present a comprehensive theory of the determination of the output level, the price level, and total employment. This is 16.2, some important concepts. Schedules and functions. In this chapter, we will consider aggregate supply schedules. The terms schedule and function are used interchangeably in the economics literature. We prefer to use function to depict a relationship between variables such as spending and income. A reminder box. In Chapter 7, Methods, Tools, and Techniques, we introduce the essential and analytical and introductory techniques that students should learn in order to grasp in macroeconomics. As a reminder, economic models use schedules or curves to depict behavior, which can either be uh, ex ante, ex ante, I'm not really sure what that means, <laughs> ex ante, uh, prior to action and reflecting planned or desired action by households, firms, governments, and so on, or ex ex post, uh, representing actual outcomes that are the results of action. In the simplest macroeconomic model of expenditure, income, and employment, we encounter uh, an aggregate demand schedule and an aggregate supply schedule. These schedules depict uh, ex ante behavior and tell us what we expect the outcomes will be given other conditions in the economy. Yeah, oh, given other conditions in the economy. The employment output function. First, we consider how f- total employment in the economy is, is generated so that when we understand what determines a unit labor cost to develop a theory employment that is it that is explained its level and movement over time in relation to a monetary ex- economy operating under capitalist conditions we need to develop an understanding of how employment is related to output determination this relationship is also important important because per unit labor cost or total labor cost derived by total output underpin the pricing of output via a price markup. In this context, we developed the concept of employment output function, which show how much labor is required to produce a good uh, given volume of output. Given the output that the firm plans to produce to meet expected land uh, demand, Employment will be determined by the productivity of labor. We shall argue that productive or production decisions are typically made in an environment of a stable wage rates and capital labor ra- ra- ratios. The capital labor ratio depicts the combination of productive capital or machines and equipment and so on. Uh, and labor that defines the current productive technology. For example, an ex- excavation firm might provide a hand shovel to each worker a- uh, engaged in digging foundations, uh, yeah, foundations for a new building. This would be a low capital labor ra- ratio production technology. Sometimes this is referred to as a labor intensive technology. Alternatively, it could use mechanical digging equipment and employ fewer workers to produce the same output. 
In this instance, the production process would employ higher capital ratio techniques, sometimes referred to as a capital intensive production. We can write the employment output function as 16.1 uh, capital Y equals lowercase y and capital N. When capital N is the total number of workers employed, uh, little y, I would say that, is the rate of uh, labor productivity, and capital Y is planned produced, or sorry, planned production based on ex uh, expected, uh, expected spending. What is labor productivity? Labor productivity is defined as a physical output per unit of labor input per period of time. So we could solve equation 16.1 for small y to get couple of y slash couple n, which is the uh, algebra equivalent of our dis dis definition. The higher, the, the higher is labor productivity, uh, small y, the less employment is required to produce a unit of output for the given production techniques explicit in little y. Factories which influence little y include technology. Technology, uh, technology uh, is it uh, is it best uh, is the best practice capital or labor intensive? As in our excavation firm example, uh, workers skill and motivation and management skill and business organization. In the public arena, discussions about slow productivity growth often focus usually. I'm sorry, unduly, on the worker with claims with such as poor motivation and skill gaps. Rarely is management skill or a failure thereof the focus of inquiry, despite evidence that poor management decision-making is the cause of slow productivity growth. For instance, uh, failure to invest in the latest technology will hamper growth in labor productivity, as demonstrated in Box 16.1. In box 16.1, the perils of neglected or uh, neglecting innovation. In the 1950s, the large American steel companies fell behind their Japanese and European uh, competitors because they failed to scrap the old open uh, health, uh, open hearth uh, furnaces and invest in the uh, latest blast furnaces. In the 1960s, they also failed to convert to continuous uh, casting process, uh, which delivered a superior productivity. A more recent example can be found in the airline industry uh, in the late 1970s. The Australian airline uh, Qantas uh, dominated the international travel market for Australians, carrying around 42% of the Australian travelers abroad by 2012, this proportion had dropped to 18%. As competition from airlines such as uh, Emirates and Singapore Airlines had cut into its market share, there are uh, there are many reasons for this decline in market share. And but one of the major explanations was that the uh, Qantas management made poor decisions with respect to its fleet upgrades. It refuses, it refused to invest in the uh, latest jets, which were more fuel efficient and hence could operate uh, at lower cost. If uh, small y is stable in the short run within the current investment cycle, then once the firm decides on the level of output to produce to satisfy expected demand, it simultaneously knows how much workers must be employed. As an example, as an example, if it takes ten workers to produce one thousand units of output per day, then da then daily labor uh, productivity would be one hundred units per worker. Accordingly, if the first anticipated uh, an increase to output to say. 1,500 uh, units per day, it would require an additional five workers to ensure it could supply the new higher level of output. Uh, figure 16.1 presents two different employment output functions for the economy, each in associated with the constant but different value of small y 
and the functions are positively um, positively sloped straight lines. And if a firm's expected aggregate demand was 1,200 units in the current production uh, production period, say per week, then given the state of technology represented by small y, it would employ 600 workers each week if a small y equals 2 or lower producti productivity and 400 workers if small y equals 3 or high productivity. Firms produce based on expected aggregate spending, and once all these sectors have made their spending decision, that is, once aggregate demand is actually re realized, the firm's dis discussion, rather uh, whether their expectations were accurate or not, in other words, they find out whether they have overproduced, underproduced, or produced the right amount only after spending has occurred. Money wages. Productivity is an uh, is an important uh, compound component. Component. There we go. Uh, the cost of produ producing each unit of output, uh, or unit cost. Another major component of unit cost are labor cost, which is influenced by the pre uh, prevailing wage uh, rates. We assume that money wage rates are uh, exogenous in the short run. This is not the same as assuming that money wages rates never change. It merely says that in terms of parameters of our aggregate supply model, that is the difference between our different influences that are considered will impact our, on aggregate supply. Money wage rate will be assumed to be uh, invari uh, invariant, uh, invariant in the short run. Before we discuss the possible functions which make this a uh, reasonable assumption, we must clarify some often confused concepts relating to wages. RC Chapter 12. First, let us uh, distinguish between the money wage rate and real wage rate. The money wage weight, uh, rate is determined in the labor market and, and is the amount of nominal current or current dollar terms that the workers receive uh, per hour or some other period when they sell their labor power to the capitalist business or firms or other employers, for example, government, they actually make way, uh, the, the actual money wage at any point in time is the outcome of negotiated government uh, agreements between employers and empl uh, employers and workers, either as a de decentralized level or through sectoral uh, sector or economic wide negotiations between peak employer groups and trade unions. These money wage, uh, Bargains are negotiated in the context of prevailing government policy with respect to minimum or living wages. In some nations, uh, such as Australia, there have been a history of wage setting tribunals or courts which had, that had led to the practice of industrial relations in general and the determination of wages in particular becoming a specialized judicial process, thereby reflecting the, adver the adversarial nature of relations between workers and capital. The money wage outcome at any point in time is heavily dependent on the bargaining strengths of parties involved. Wage uh, changes occurred, uh, occur at infrequent intervals and conditions the and conditions and condition the behavior of the party concern, concerned for the insu, uh, ensuring economic or ensuing, excuse me, uh, economic period uh, are sometimes months, usually years. It is this frequent nature of wage setting via uh, institutional structure, such as employer and union negotiations, and the impl implied contractual nature of the wage relationship existing between employers and workers over some future period that are used to justify the assumption that money wages are uh, exogenous and uh, fixed in the short run, the purpose of developing the expl explanation of aggregate supply. What is the basis of the money wage inflexibility assumption? First, negotiations over money wages typically occur in frequent intervals as 
noted above. Second, there is a strong evidence that, that workers resist cuts in money wages and firms generally prefer not to push for, for such cuts. This is because the structure of wages across all uh, occupations and sectors represent an indicator uh, of social status. Workers are very aware of wage relativities, uh, or, you know, relativities and are loath to agree to a reduction in their relative rank given that a signal given it signals to reduction in their social status. One group of workers will form the view that an economic downturn if they accept lower money wages and other workers resist the reduction than their relative position to compromise and there is no certainty that the relative re relativity will be restored when economic conditions improve. Only in extraordinary circumstances relating to the imminent collapse of the enterprise in which they are employed and the existence of high, very high levels of unemployment I have, we observe workers agreeing to money wage reductions. Third, the downward uh, rigidity of money wages is also the result of employer preferences. Even when the unemployment rate approaches a double digit, a rate considered high by historical standards, the absolute number of workers not in, not in employment and relative to those who retain their jobs is small. As such, employers are reluctant to uh, risk jeopardizing con uh, convivial, convivial okay, inter <laughs> industrial uh, relations with most workers to possibly improve the employment pr uh, prospects of a small proportion of employment workers. The costs, uh, costs of being a capricious employer in a downtown can, oh, downturn, excuse me, can come back to Honda firm when some improve, uh, would sometimes improve and they find that workers prefer to take jobs in other firm, perhaps their co competitors. But that being said, I will be right back. Stay tuned for more. And welcome back. Uh, we are still on 243, page-wise, in the book you see on your screen in Chapter 16. We consider these issues in more detail in Chapter 17, Unemployment and Inflation. The real uh, wage rate is the purchasing power equivalent of money wage rate, uh, wage rate, that is, how much output the workers can, a worker can buy with a dollar of the money or nominal wage. The real wage is uh, calculated by deflation, deflating the money wage by a price index. We learn how deflators are constructed and are used to convert current, uh, current price variables uh, into constant price, uh, price or real variables in Chapter 4. The choice of deflator depends on this context. The real wage from the perspective of the worker uh, would be the money wage expressed in terms of consumption of good equ uh, equivalents. So we would consider this rate to be the money rate, uh, the money wage rate, and div divided by a measure of consumer price such as a G GPI or CPI, excuse me. From the employer's perspective, the real or pro uh, product wage is more accurately measured by the money wage paid to workers divided by the specific price the firm receives for its output, which is a narrower concept than the real wage considered from the, considered from the perspective of the worker. It is unlikely that the path of prices received, received for the output of any particular firm over time would mirror the path of consumer price as a whole. This must always be taken into account when we distinguish impacts on individual firms versus impacts on the economy as a whole. Workers will want their nominal wages to grow at least as fast as consumer price grows so that their will, the real wages do not decline. On the other hand, many firms will be unable to increase their prices at this rate, meaning that the, wage, uh, the real wage they face would be rising if they were to agree to raise the nominal wages they pay at the rate that consumer prices grow, are growing. 
Importantly, the real wage is not determined in the labor market and can only be influenced by the workers uh, in, in, as much, in as much as they can influence the money wage rate outcome. This is, this is because the real wage is a ratio of two prices, the money wage determined in the labor market and the consumer price level determined in the goods and services market and influenced by the price setting behavior of firms. The two prices that form the real wage rate are determined by different forces in different markets in the economy. As you will see, the, see prices are largely set by business firms in the goods and services product market account according to desired market ups on cost prices are not fixed by workers e uh, economists and other often draw uh, on classical employment theory see chapter 12 and argue that workers should cut their real wages to produce or to improve should be the employment prospects of the employed uh, however the policy However, the policy suggests is without merit, even if the, pro the proposition were based on the, on, the, on the causal understanding of how mass unemployment occurs, there are several preliminary but critical questions that such bill uh, pro proposals fail to answer. One, how can workers achieve a cut in their real wages when they can only, uh, uh, can only influence the money wage outcome? And two, how, how might a money wage change influence price changes? In particular, a money wage cut may lead to price cuts due to the fall in the cost of production and thus leave the real wage unchanged. These initial queries stand quite apart, quite apart from the dispute among economists as to whether a real wage cut would influence uh, employment growth independently of, a ch of changes in effective demand. As we saw in Chapter 12, employment is determined by total output rather than real wages. 16.3, the price determination. Clearly, a firm seeks to generate a profit over and above the cost of production. How does it go, uh, how, how does it go above setting the price, or I'm sorry, how does it go about, not above, uh, about? setting the price that is that it will accept for its output to achieve its ambitious for profit for, for profit there we go firms are assumed to to operate in a non-competitive economy you may have considered the case of perfect competition in a macroeconomics course where firms are assumed to have no price setting discretion because the market is so large and firms are uh, so are assumed to be so small. The environment does not arise in the real world. We, we are thus introducing uh, Abligaba, Jesus, okay, so <laughs> uh, Alig, 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 uh, Poli, as a basic assumption rather than following the orthodox practice of using perfect competition as a benchmark. So just kind of go back to that word, just so you know, it's spelled out as O-L-I-G-O-P-O-L-Y. So it's what, a tongue tire for me. Anyway, uh, actually, if you want to, you can put it down the bottom and see if you can spell it out. Maybe I can get it from there, but who knows. Anyway, uh, like, share, and subscribe. <laughs> and hit the bell while you're at it. Anyway, so let's see. Okay, so let's see, benchmark by... That same word, I'll try it again, uh, oligopoly, we mean a, produ a product market in which there are a small number of sellers, hence we assume that f uh, firms are price setters rather than price takers. Firms are assumed to fix their prices as a, sm as a markup over cost. Economists are divided about the de determination, de wait, determinants, there we go, of the markup and the costs that are considered relevant in the pricing decisions by firms. Further debate remains as to whether the markup is invariant to the state of demand. However, the use of the markup as a basic description of firm behavior is the wor uh, real world and is difficult to, to dispute in the uh, wait in the, dis the difficult to dispute. There we go. In the real world, firms typically have discretionary price setting power and seek a rate of uh, return to, on the capital. 
employed with or employed which uh necess- necessitate necessitates that they generate a profit margin over their total cost of production the total price per unit sold must therefore cover its variable variable cost of production per unit of output such as labor and raw material costs plus the profit margin they the profit margin is is designed to cover overheads and other fixed costs plus net profit firms are thus assumed to employ a market prices or pricing mo- model such as such that in 16.2 uh p which i think is purchase uh equals uh one plus uh, m for I think so, uh, is an import uh, capital W is workers slash uh, small y. So I'm not really sure what that is, but anyway, uh, where P is oh okay, so it's price. I'm sorry, not not not, not purchase. Uh, where P is the price of output, M is the markup. Okay, I got that wrong too. Anyway, uh, is the markup on per unit labor cost. W is the money wage per hour, and y and small y is labor productivity per hour. At this stage, we abstract from raw material cost. Thus, small y is defined as units of output per unit of labor input per hour. And if small y equals uh, 0.5, then two labor hours are required to produce one unit of output. If the money wage or capital W was $5, per hour than the unit labor cost that is labor cost per unit of output would be 10. As noted the markup uh, or small m is set to provide a surplus above the direct unit labor cost to account for fixed overhead labor and other fixed costs including interest payments on loans in addition to provision for uh, profits return on uh, equity. This is a gross profit measure as the firm must also cover taxes and other business expenses, accounting services, advertising, and, lo- and legal expenses out of, the, out of the market. The amount of profit desired to relate to in part uh, to the amount of investment that the firms plan to undertake because uh, retained earnings are an important source of internal finance that the firm draws on to reduce its exposure to the to the higher costs of external funding new uh, new projects. In the short run, the price will be rigid with the firm supplying output according to demand. Price changes will would occur when there were when there were changes in the money wage rate or other variable costs, markup or margin, or trend uh, labor productivity. Uh, trend, uh, trend labor pro- pro- productivity is used here to differ- uh, differentiate if from the cyclical swing that swings, sorry, that occur in labor productivity, which we consider in section 16.6. The markup or margin, uh, small m, reflects the, mar- the market power of the firm. The higher the market power, the higher will be for the margin. Thus, in more competitive sectors, the margin would tend to be lower than in, than in less competitive sec- sectors. Changes in competitiveness of a sector will, over time, lead to changes in the size of the markup. If our example, the markup, or a small m, is set at 40%, then the firm of price is output at fourteen dollars per unit, or ten dollar ten dollar multiplied by uh, one point four, one point forty. The features of this approach to price determination are as follows: one, prices are unambiguously a function of cost; two, firms use their price setting discretion to generate a monetary surplus above average variable cost. This monetary surplus is designed to cover profits. In the short run, profits are influenced by the ability of firms to realize markups uh, on their unit cost. Factors which squeeze the market up, da- uh, market uh, markup, are down to say uh, thirty cents, thirty uh, percent. Sorry, will accordingly also squeeze profits per unit of output. Number three, the volume of profits. Uh, as direct distinct sorry as distinct from per unit profit depends on the size of the markups which 
influence profit per unit of output, and the actual volume of output sold in any period. The latter is determined by the state of aggregate demand in the economy, and as we saw in Chapter 15, is determined by the level of household consumption expenditure, private investment expenditure, and net exports and government spending. Number four, usually markup theories assume that the immediate impact of changes in demand on the markup and hence price is small. For the planning period ahead, firms calculate their cost and, de and desired profits on the basis of an expected level of output, which they believe can sell. Deviations, uh, deviations in this expected level of demand promote output changes rather than price changes. For example, it is expensive to alter prices once uh, cataloged, catalogs uh, are advertised. Although the rising use of one-line shopping sites has somewhat reluctant and uh, reduced, I'm sorry, this form of, a fl of inflexibility, firms also desire to see be seen as reliable suppliers at state prices, stated prices. Number five, the markup impacts directly on the real wage that, that workers receive, assume for com uh, simplicity that total markup costs only include wage costs. Total wage costs are the produ product of the money wage rate, or W, and the number of workers uh, employed, N, that is WN. In this case, a simplified mar uh, price markup model would be M16.3, P equals 1 plus M W slash Y equals 1 plus M uh, is W N slash Y. Where all the terms are as defined previously, the particular average labor productivity Y equals Y and N and W N uh, slash Y are wage uh, cost per unit of output. In other words, Per unit labor costs, which are defined above, we are uh, we can rewrite this as in 16.4, a uh, couple of y, 1 plus m equals wnp. And further rearrange yields, uh, 16.5, wp equals y and n, 1 equal, uh, plus m equals y, 1 plus m. Which, uh, which shows that the real wage, or WP, is dependent on the average productivity of labor, or Y and N, and the size of the markup. The larger the markup, uh, small m, uh, other things being equal, the lower is the real wage. 16.4, the aggregate supply function, or AS. Before we consider complicated uh, factors, such as changes in productivity and competitiveness, it is useful to consider that price determination rules uh, rule means for the shape of the aggregate supply functions. If we assume that M, W, and Y are constant in the short run, then the aggregate supply curve would be a horizontal, a horizontal line in the graph of price against in real income up to some full capacity utilization point, or Y. Economists sometimes refer to a horizontal line in the context as being perfect, uh, perfectly elastic, firms and aggregates uh, and aggregate will supply as, as much output or goods and services as they expect will be demanded at the uh, current price level set according to the markup rule described above, or on the previous page in this case. So far, we have assumed that labor costs are the only variable costs. If labor productivity is constant in other direct variable production costs, such as a raw, such as raw materials, are are constant per unit of outputs, the aggregate supply curve will be elastic at the uh, constant price associated with marking uh, per unit production cost. Also, the labor de demand curve at both the firm and aggregate level will uh, will be elastic at the going weight money wage, so, uh, subject to the level of aggregate demand. Figure 16.2 shows the way in which the price set by all firms, or P, at point in time is distributed as incomes 
Here, the current uh, level of output, which is sold, is Y. The price, uh, the price P, is based on the markup on the total unit variable cost, which covers fixed costs including labor over uh, overheads and uh, and an allowance for profit. Total spending in the overall uh, overall economy is the area defined by P plus uh, P times Y, and the distri distribution uh, the level of of uh, where's the of output uh, and income is shown by the areas follow the price line. Fixed costs are represented by the rectangle A, uh, whereas uh, rect rect rectangle oh yeah rectangle the uh, B represents net profits. Hmm. Firms produce a given level of output according to their expectations of total spending. In the economy, for our simplicity, we assume the production is in line with sales Y. In fact, the total uh, output sold may be less than firm expected and hence less than they produced. The variable costs, namely labor and raw materials, cost more, more, uh, wait, raw materials costs, which are in incurred in producing the unsold output must still be met. This unsold output would add to the stock of inventory of final output. Conversely, if, uh, if sales are higher than expected, then the stock of inventories will be reduced. In, the same, in, in that sense, the net profits generated may be below or above the level that the firms aimed to achieve at the beginning of the production period. Firms may plan to increase profits in future by raising markups. A horizontal uh, segment in figure 60.2 has been explained by the prior markup rule and the assumption of constant unit cost. But why does it become vertical after full employment? Figure 16.3 is similar to 16.2, but adds the full capacity utilization level of real output. To derive the to, to derive the general aggregate supply function, or AS, the, this AS function is sometimes referred to as a reverse L, shape for obvious reasons. After the point of full employment, the economy exhausts its capacity to expand short-term or short-run output due to a shortage of labor and capital equipment. Firms will be trying to uh, outbid each other for the already fully employed labor resources, and is doing so when so doing so would drive money wages up. Also, there is the possibility of prices of raw material uh, being driven up by the high levels of demand. We will return to this possibility later in this chapter. Online, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, under normal circumstances, the economy will rarely approach the output level of Y, which means that for normal utilization rates, the economy faces constant cuts. There, there is some debate about whether the raising co uh, cost might be uh, encountered, given that all firms are unlikely to ha hit full capacity simultaneously. The reverse L shape simplifies the analysis and somewhat by assuming that the ca capacity constraint is reached by all firms at the oh wait, bottlenecks, so there we go, same time, uh, bottlenecks in production are likely to occur in some sectors before others uh, and so cost, uh, and so cost pr uh, pressure, pressures will begin to amount uh, begin to mount, not mount, but mount before overall full capacity output. This could be captured in figure 16.3 for some uh, uh, curvature near uh, Y, thus eliminating the right angle as price began to rise before reaching uh, Y or full capacity. We consider this issue in more detail in chapter 17. The theory of production. The theory of production that we have presented here, which underpins the model of pricing, is based on several stylist uh, facts from the real world. The capacity of firms to substitute one input, say labor, for another, say capital, in a production process is limited. In the real world, a typical firm employs a number of machines and types of equipment which have more or less fixed labor requirements. 
than idle machines typically accompany idle workers when the economy goes into a downturn. Uh, economies are rarely as at, rarely at full capacity, so that the existing capital stocks is rarely fully uh, rarely it, is rarely fully uh, utilized. And with that being said, I'll be right back. Stay tuned. Hey, welcome back. Uh, we are still on page, or sorry, right, chapter 16 of uh, the book you see in front of you. Uh, 20, uh, 248 is the page. Uh, take the simple example of uh, cleaning firm which uses uh, brooms as, as its principal technology and services a contract to sweep rooms and office blocks each day. It's, it is hard to imagine two workers pushing one broom or one worker pushing two brooms. To start production, the firm needs to combine its productive inputs in a fixed ratio, in this case, one to one. If the firm gained a contract for more office cleaning, which exceeds the, exceeded the capacity of one cleaner, then it would have to give the technology being used add another broom for the second worker to use and so on. So the productive inputs are added in fixed prop proportions defined by the technology being used. It doesn't violate uh, yeah, doesn't violate reality too much to simply to simply so simplify. There we go. The stylus, uh, stylized by fact by assuming what economists refer to as fixed input coefficients technology. Consequently, we reject the law of diminishing return, which we outlined in Chapter 11 as being an account uh, representation of a condition of production in the macroeconomy. Macro Under this so-called law, the stock of capital is always assumed to be fully utilized. Falling a marginal productivity occurs when so-called laws oh wait, occurs when, when uh, more labor is employed with the next, with the fixed stock, excuse me, of capital. Thus, it, uh, thus, in uh, contrast to the fixed input coefficient technology, and uh, describes uh, described above, the law of diminishing return relies on the uh, relies on the capital labor ratio declining in the short run when employment increases, so that each worker has less capital. Thus. The neoclassical assertion that capital is the form of specific plant and equipment is fixed in the short run, chapter, uh, see chapter 11, confuses the distinction between the stock of capital and value terms, its monetary worth, and the flow of its service, services that the stock produces as revealed by the rate of capacity utilization. Neoclassical production function analysis, which is standard in most textbooks, assumes that in the short run, with all other production inputs, capital, land, and so on, fixed output will increase at a decreasing rate in, uh, as uh, more hours of employment are used by firms. However, in the real world, the actual relationship between changes in, in labor hours and changes in their output may not exhibit diminishing returns because other productive inputs may vary in the same proportion as the labor input. The neoclassical production function enables neoclassical economists to postulate increasing marginal cost as output increases, that is, costs increase faster as more output is produced. In turn, this leads to an inverse relationship between labor demand and the real work and the, the real wage. These relationships derive from the assumption that firms produce and employ labor such as such that their profits are maximized at a given price and money wage. 
The volatility of the law of diminishing return has been the subject of considerable controversy. In essence, it is a theoretical con construct and unproven assertion. No conclusive empirical evidence has been has ever been assembled to a sub um, substantiate this law as a reasonable generation uh, gen generalization of production relationships in modern monetary economies. On this contrary, there is a mass of empirical evidence available deriving or derived from actual studies of business firms to support the view that costs of production are constant in the relevant or normal range of output and that the law of diminishing returns is not applicable. Some properties of the aggregate supply function. Section. The AS equation is simply the price determination model equation, or 16.2, which shows that in the short run, the behavior of aggregate supply in the economy depends on, depends on the markup, or M, the money wage rate, W, labor uh, productivity, or Y, and raw material cost per unit of output. Here, we focus on changes in M, W, and Y accordingly. One, if the money wage rate, other things in the money, uh, if the, if the money uh, wage rate rises, other things being equal, the unit cost of production rise, rises in firms would tra uh, translate this in, uh, this in time into price rise, thereby restoring the previous markup. Two, if there is a, if there is growth in labor productivity, or small y, say because of increased labor force morale, increased skill levels, more te technological, tech pretty much, based production techniques, uh, better management, and the like, then units cost uh, y slash, no, sorry, w slash y will fall. This means that the firms can generate the same profit margin at lower prices. The, a, the AS function would thus shift downwards by the extent uh, by the extent of the decline in markup unit cost. Variations in the markup uh, M will cause uh, the price level to change. Increases in industrial uh, concentration more adversely uh, advertised. Excuse me, more advertising and such may lead to firms being able to increase the overall profit margin in a level that can be sustained. Tight conditions in the goods and services market where sales are constrained may lead firms to reduce the markup uh, as they are uh, as they all struggle for market share. This could also occur if strong trade unions successfully push for money wage increases. Thus, to avoid losing market share, the firms may choose to absorb some of the cost rises by not raising prices, which means the, the that the markup has been squeezed. If employment is below full employment, then actual output is less than Y, which means there are there is an output gap. Increases in aggregate demand or spending that are seen to seen by firms to be permanent will result in an expansion of output within without any price increases occurring. If the firms are unused, uh, unsure of the durability of the demand expansion, they may resist hiring new workers and utilize increased overtime instead. In other words, they initially respond to the increased aggregate spending by increasing hours of work rather than persons employed. The higher cost associated with paying overtime rates are likely to be absorbed in the profit margin because firms want to maintain their overall market share. The aggregate supply function is a useful vehicle for exploring an inflationary prices uh, price process excuse me, arising from a conflict between groups over the distribution of income. We, uh, we postpone this analysis until uh, chapter 17, which is the next one up. 16.5, what determines the level of employment? A firm will hire according to the demand for its services, and its demand for labor will not be very sensitive, not be very sensitive to wage changes. However, it will make decisions based on the variability of its operations based on 
are based in part on wage costs. But on day-to-day -day, uh, basis, if it uh, if it if it is profitable at the current wage rates, then it will increase or decrease its demand for labor based on based on its expected sales. In other words, effective demand drives labor demand. Firms hire the number of workers they need to produce the amount of output they think they can sell at a profit. There, if there has been a pr prolonged downturn, that we will observe idle capital and labor unemployment. The unemployed workers are willing to work at the current wage rates that are that. Wait, but there is no demand for their services because effective demand is too low. Fixed factor input, a uh, fixed factor input, proportions mean that firms face constant unit cost over the normal range of production, assuming that money wages are fixed in the short run and labor productivity is constant. If the firm receives increased orders for its output, then it will seek to maintain its market share by increasing output. Assuming constant unit cost, the firm uh, bring, uh, will bring its idle co capital back into production and hire more workers. There will be no pressure on the firm to raise prices because there will be no upward pressure on per unit cost. As output rises, there is increased demand for labor at the constant money wage. This suggests that the AS curve expressed as a function of the price level is very flat over the normal range of output. Increases in nominal demand will be met by increases in output or income. There are several reasons why firms might be reluctant to increase prices even though costs may raise or rise uh, temporarily. As we explain below, or as we explain below, or reduce them when aggregate demand falls. Industries are characterized by a few dominant firms that exercise market power. Consumer loyalty to products of other firms means that they will not re uh, react to a price fall of similar product products. A price cut will reduce re revenue if not uh, wait if it if it did not induce a sufficient number of cons uh, consumers to switch brands. Further, competitors might march, uh, might match excuse me, lower prices in order to retain their customers or consumers. There are significant costs involved in adjusting prices. Firms have to produce new price tags and catalogs. 16.6 .6 factors. Effective aggregate output per hour. Uh, that's the title of the section here. What factors determine the impact of change in hours and of employment are on aggregate output over the long term, many influences are at work. This, these include improvements in technology, changes in the average quality of labor through increased education and improved health, and changes in organ organizational and management skills, which will lead to a steady increase in level of output that is produced from a given quantity of output. In seeking to understand short-lived employment and output determination, we adopt the view that these influences work slowly over time, and so we abstract from them in our short-run analysis. We call this a pro-cyclical movement in an outcome per hour, which means that outcome per unit of labor input increases as the level of production and employment increases. The procyclical pattern of labor productivity out or output per hour means the per unit cost will decline as employment rises and the economy moves forward or forward uh, full capacity utilization. However, total production's cost will, ob will obviously rise. And 16, uh, figure 16.4 show, shows real output per person in the U.S. manufacturing sector over a 30-year period. The shaded area are the recessions defined by the U.S. National Bureau of Economic Research, or NBER. The, behavioral, uh, the behavior of labor productivity is clearly pro-cyclical. During recession, when output is falling, productivity falls. 
There, this is and uh, this is in con uh, contradiction to the law of diminishing marginal productivity. The behavior of real output per hour worked is uh, similar pro 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 cyclical. There we go. The U.S. behavior is a similar way to all advanced uh, economies with respect to pro cyclical movements in labor productivity in the uh, manufacturing sector. Next section is the choice of production technology. Neoclassical production theory considers that firms can substitute labor and capital freely. Thus, if the relative price of labor increases, firms will quickly use less labor and more capital. We have seen that firms are rarely able to substitute inputs quickly and to use more capital and less labor typically requires a total change in technology. The increase in money wages relates relate to the uh, current relative excuse me to the current price of output would would have to be uh, very large to justify the firms scrapping their existing technology. Consider how firms might act under the fixed input ratio assumptions or assumption based on it based based on the available technologies and the projected relative cost of labor and capital into the future, a typical firm will choose the lower, lowest cost technology. In turn, this will set the capital labor input ratio by which it will be bound in the coming, uh, in the coming production uh, periods. And many, oh, sorry, in making that decision, the firm is also committing to a, a certain labor demand given the relationship between the technology being used and the associated input proportions. When installed, uh, once installed, the capital becomes what econ economists call free good, or a free good. Rel relative to its purchase and installation cost, the, the variable costs of running the capital are usually low Economists refer to sunk costs as res in respect of a major uh, cost uh, of acquiring capital equipment, which means that the firm has already incurred them uh, incurred them when whether it runs the plant or not. According to firm, uh, according accordingly, the firm will use as much capital as required to produce the current output that is a that is being demanded. When demand falls, the firm the firm simply leaves some proportion of their capital stock idle or underutilized. But in doing so, they at, they shed labor and are reduced our and or reduce working hours because the variable costs of labor input are relative, relatively high when compared to the fixed hiring and relative cost. What role does the real wage play in this? Even if the real wage fell to zero, the firms would not employ more workers if aggregate demand didn't justify it. Firms will not produce if there there is not a prospect of sale or bearing the uh, barring the small proportion of production they they keep as inventory to smooth out orders. The pro cyclical movements in labor productivity uh, seems like one of the last sections here. Uh, as noted, firms will leave machines idle in the light of low demands or demand for their product or services. When the demand uh, for their product and services rises, firms will first try to utilize existing staff and capital more fully. Thus, workers will be encouraged to work faster and or longer so that productivity per worker rises. So in the short order or short run cost, might rise as over time premiums are paid. While firms decide whether the, whether the increase in demand is permanent or uh, transitory, if the rise in demand is sustained, firms will take or firms will then increase staff and, if necessary, invest in additional capital equipment. Unit labor costs will rise, will fall once new staff are hired and over time uh, over time declines. On the other hand. In downturns, firms do not fully adjust their workforce down because they do not wish to lose experienced workers. Consequently, employment uh, employment tends to fluctuate 
less than output or, or production, with labor being uh, hoarded to some degree in a, in a recession and utilized more intensely or in intensively at the beginning of a boom. Thus, labor productivity is pro-cyclical, which, which accords with the evidence depicted in figure 16.4. Further, if we return to our uh, example of the, uh, the cleaning firm, it as it obtains more contracts for servicing, it may first require to ex uh, require the existing workforce to clean more office per day, perhaps by a speed up. We would observe a rise in labor productivity. At some point, the firm must hire an additional worker and and add a broom. Meanwhile, labor. Uh, productivity might be lower for a while until the firm adds enough contracts to fully utilize the larger workforce. For these reasons, we observe a cyclical component to labor productivity that is in, uh, inconsistent with diminishing, return, uh, diminishing marginal productivity under neoclassical production theory. Also, it is implausible that labor productivity for the economy as a whole would rise and fall over the short periods to the degree that we observe if we if it were due to supply side effects such factors such as te technology change or improved in education and training of the workforce, these factors may have an impact on labor productivity in the long run. We have noted that fun fluctuations of demand can contribute to observe pro-cyclical labor productivity and manufacturing. The following factors can also contribute to the observed pattern of labor productivity. First, the composition of aggregate output is important because the value of output per hour of employment varies considerably among the firms and com industries that comprise the total economy. For example, the manufacturing or manufacturer of high-tech electri electrical goods would have a much greater output per hour of labor input than the provision of hairdressing services. Even if diminishing return were operating at the individual firm level by assumption, not a fact, it is most unlikely that countercyclical productivity growth would be observed at the aggregate level. The composition of output across in the industries champion, uh, uh, changes excuse me, as output increases, but the changes are such that the industries with diminished returns are most apparently experienced a reduced share of total output. Then labor productivity can increase as total output rises. Second and of great, and, and of great practical importance is the observation that most firms designed to maintain long-term relationships or relations with their labor forces. The re reason for this behavior re relates to the fixed cost of hiring or recruiting, screening, training, and redundancy provisions, and to the need to maintain morale among the workers. Are also reluctant to dismiss specialized workers for fear of losing them permanently. Un, uh, likewise, cutting money wages will re redistribute money, uh, total revenue towards profits if prices are maintained, but will demand relationships with incumbent workers who may quit when their job opportunities become available. Widespread, widespread wage cuts might d damage aggregate demand and workers will have less income to spend. Uh, over the long run, if demand continues to grow, firms will invest in plant and equipment that incorporates the largest technology, which typically increases labor productivity. Fewer, fewer labor hours to produce the same amount of output. In addition to increasing production capacity, firms will also engage in, in other activities that raise labor productivity, such as re reorganizing the workplace and improving time management. Labor production uh, will increase. In addition, uh, uh, raising unit labor costs due to uh, uh, rising wages will provide the incentive for firms to increase labor productivity over longer periods through such initiatives. Thus, raising wages can spur research and development that lead 
leads to innovation in technology. Orthodox economists tend to attribute both the short-run and long-run trends of labor productivity to supply-side factors and ignore the major impacts of aggregate demand. This is neither theoretical sound, nor does it explain the empirical data and on labor productivity over time. Conclusion. In this chapter, we had developed a markup price model, which we argue is re representative of that price setting behavior of many firms uh, in a modern monetary economy. This is not to deny that pricing of production products such as fruit and vegetables is market driven so that shortages or, gl or, or gluts are reflected in current prices. The chapter has also provided some insights as to how firms behave when market conditions change. A key point is that there are good reasons why firms firms do not typically attempt to vary the money wages of their employers, employees, excuse me, according to prevailing labor market conditions. This is at odds with the conclusions of the classical model, which view price and wage flexibility as essential to the achievement of full employment. This view resonates with many economists today, despite the fact that it is based on the fallacy of composition. Well, uh, tomorrow would be, yeah, tomorrow would be Part D, uh, Unemployment and Inflation Theory and, pol and Policy. Uh, also, uh, 17, uh, which where I'm going to continue from tomorrow, uh, 17, uh, Employment and Inflation. Um, thanks for listening. Uh, I hope it wasn't too long for you. I hope I didn't flub too many, too many words, and I hope that you do consider subscribing, commenting, liking, sharing, hitting the, uh, the bell for notification, and to visit the websites I have below in the description again below. Either way, I hope you guys have a good uh, good day, and I'll talk to you uh, later. Peace out for now.